Nothing like a nice cup of tea. <laughs> All right. Hello and welcome back to episode two on the game that we're making. So today we're going to talk about the visuals and the aesthetics of the game. Done a little off camera work. If I hit this button, if I hit the right. Oh, no, nope, that's not this button. So, this is our new test level. It is very <laughs> uh, foresty, as you can see. It's sort of the vibe that I'm going for. It's lush and it's colorful and it's simple. So it's probably a good idea to talk about the, the inspirations behind this kind of style that we're working with. The main inspiration for me would be a short hike and the art style in that. I'll put some little doobly-doos up on the screen, some little footage of that. It's got that really unlit look. If we just jump into the game and I press F2, we get this really flat, two-dimensional, there's no lighting at all look. I love games that have this kind of style, but the reason that I didn't stick with this is because I want there to be dynamic shadows and, you know, when it's nighttime and you've got a torch or a lantern or something to be casting these crazy shadows everywhere. Uh, using, like, emissive textures or, like, an unlit scene would render that impossible. So first thing you'll notice is the cell shaded look. If you're not aware of what cell shading is, this will be a good example. So... All right, lights have been turned off. If I go to my post-processing volume and set the bounds to not infinite, then you can see this is what the game looks like without cell shading. So the light has a smooth curve from white to black. But if we enable the cell shading effect, you get these distinct bands of luminosity. If you had a character, for example, let me turn my shit back on. Got our little test character here. And instead of having a smooth gradient from his shiny bald head to the shadows on his face, there's just these distinct lines. And it gives that effect of a three-dimensional object being two-dimensional, like an animated cartoon and whatnot. And we're going to save always control S every two minutes, every one minute, every 30 seconds. I do it every time I make an action, I commit it. We'll probably start off by looking at how the cell shader works because it's a doozy. It's a, it's a fucking piece of work and it took me a long time to rig up. So this is <laughs> what it looks like. A lot of nodes, a lot of, a lot of mishmash of stuff. Um, essentially <laughs> what it does is that it splits up the scene into seven different luminosity levels. So you can see if I've desaturated the diffuse color, there's still a lot of variation and whatnot. Um, if I take off the desaturation, give you a look at the, give you a look at what it usually is. So this is just diffuse color. And then post processing input zero is the finish, the finish render. So this is what our game looks like before the cell shader is applied. So what we do is take the finished render and the diffuse color, desaturate both of them, and then divide post-processing input zero by the diffuse color channel. And that essentially gives us the lighting. So it basically extracts the lighting from the scene. This is the true luminosity value of our scene. And then what we do is use an if node. So if this extracted light is greater than this threshold, then if A is greater than B, do this. And this is five. <laughs> now that might not mean a lot to you. So if you just plug in a single numeral value into a color channel, it ends up being just a value between black and white. So zero being black, one being white, five being really fucking white, like this white. But here's where the magic happens. If A is less than B, then we take the diffuse color and we make it, we multiply it by this tint value, which is a parameter that I've set up. So essentially it just makes it darker. 
So with that all in mind, if you've used Photoshop before, then you'll know what darken means. So we've got two images and we're putting this one over the top of this one. Now, if there wasn't any blend mode, it would just go over the top. You wouldn't see any of this. But if we set it to darken, then only the parts of this image that are darker than this image will show up. And so anything lighter than that will essentially be transparent and you'll see through to the next layer. So with that in mind, we stack seven <laughs> of these layers on top of each other. So if we take just that and spit that into the, the scene texture, then we're left with basically the look that we're going for. But there's one little problem. So diffuse color only takes into account the color of the texture. If I take this red light and, you know, move it closer to the ground, you'll see it's just, it's just white. It's just getting brighter and brighter. It's not actually coloring it. So we end up getting post-processing input zero, which is the finished render. Then we normalize that. So what normalizing does is it takes all the luminosity from that output and Fuck me, what's the button? That's the button. And it brings them all to the same luminosity value. So this is what the colors of the scene look like when they're all just squished into, I guess it's 0.5. So then when we have this and we multiply it by our cell shader luminosity data, what we end up doing is putting all of that color back in to our black and white image and kablam we have the cell shaded look again and as a bonus colored lights if i didn't have colored lights then uh, you know it, it'd be the end of the world <laughs> so apart from the cell shaded look itself you probably notice that all of the assets that i'm using that i've lovingly crafted in blender are extremely simple low poly as people would say which means that they just don't have a lot of detail they use a very limited number of vertices i guess i guess the pillars of the aesthetic are simple meshes solid colors that's it <laughs> that's it that's all i can think of the biggest benefit of using you know low poly count models and solid colors and not much in terms of crazy processing and stuff is that the performance is like through the roof like if i go uh play standalone game i'm getting 370 380 frames a second it's a lot of frames three milliseconds to render an entire frame. It's a good sign that I can get 300 frames because this is my first time developing anything and modeling anything and texturing anything. I really don't want to accidentally make this game only playable by the, the PC elite. <laughs> so I think sticking with low poly, low texture is a win-win and Honestly, it just looks really nice. And I think once we have like challenging gameplay and, you know, blood and mature themes and stuff, <laughs> that sort of juxtaposition can be really effective. All right, so we're going to talk about the transparency. Obviously, being a top-down game, we're going to run into moments where our view is obscured by trees or a building or a really big boss or something. So what I've opted to do for the time being is set up on any material that needs to become transparent, a trace from the camera to the player that creates this sphere around the player that makes it transparent. It might look a bit weird on the recordings because of like moire and the compression and stuff i'm using dithered aa opacity rather than translucency because dithering like this so you can see they're in little patterns like how um like how comic books are shaded with dots and dots that get denser and denser 
or less dense and stuff like that. So this uses the exact same thing. And on my screen, looks fine. Can barely tell that it's like that. But the side effect of that is that we get these nice bands of translucency. And that ties into the cell shading and it suits the style. So the downside of this is that when you go into a building, so there's my little placeholder tile set for a building. As we go in, if you were actually in this building, you'd be able to see everything in it. So I might try and figure out a way because this building is made up of separate parts so that I can just not have to like prefabricate a hundred different types of buildings. I can just build it like, like I'm playing The Sims or something. Um, I'll have to find a way to group them all together so I could group all of the walls and the, the roofs together into one unit and then have a trigger so that when the player collides with maybe like a, a bounding box or something, um, they all fade from opaque to transparent. Sort of like how Diablo 2 and Diablo 3 do transparency and Path of Exile. Essentially any action RPG from this view would do transparency like that. The benefit though of using this sphere is that if we enter this forest, you still get that effect of it's a dense forest and it's shady. Even if I put in some really big trees that like come right up to the, the camera viewport, it'd still be transparent where it needs to be. And you know, the whole thing wouldn't go transparent. And at the same time, this tree might almost be in my way. And then when I move in front of it, the whole thing would go transparent, which I'm not a big fan of because then you just get these trees sort of popping in and out of existence. Whereas using this spherical opacity mask thingo, it's only transparent where it really needs to be in order to see the player. So that's that. All right, so if I go in and I open up the level blueprint, I've made a day night cycle of sorts. What happens is that depending on the time of day tick rate, the position of the sun updates and it moves by sun degrees per tick. And then depending on what time of the day it is, if it's sunrise or if it's noon or if it's sunset or nighttime, it will do different things. So for example, if it's between 87 and 110 degrees, then it's sunrise. So if it's sunrise, then every time the time of day updates, we interpolate linearly, we lerp, linear interpolate between two values for the intensity of the directional light, the intensity of the ambient light, and the color of both of those lights. And they're both tied to the current time of day and it normalizes that to a range of zero and one. So if I go ahead and get the tick rate and I speed it up, if we jump back into our game, then you'll see that the, the shadows are going very quickly and it's becoming dark and there was sunset and now it's night time and it's gonna get pitch black, like almost fully pitch black. And that's because I want a lot of the game to take place in night because this is moody as hell. This is like scary. And then sunrise and the sun came up, beautiful. And now it's noon again. So that's the day and night cycle. Looks great, feels great. We can go through this forest at night time and there's fucking shadows dancing around everywhere. And you almost forget that it's like a cell shaded cartoony game. It becomes a lot more moody when there's shadows everywhere and these, you know, and the grass helps break up those, those distinct bands of luminosity that we saw when we did the, the example. I think that's all we're going to talk about today. I think, you know, just keep it short and sweet. I think it's really important to decide on a style early on because that can drive the tone of the game and the tone of the game can drive the mechanics of the game as well. Being someone that's never done this before in their life, I think it's really important to just get things done. They might suck, they might not be optimal, but just get something on the screen and go from there. Anyway, let's uh, get my face back here. <laughs> All right, well, 
been a good time. Thanks for coming along. And next time, we'll be taking a look at the combat mechanics of the game and how the combat is going to work. And hopefully, by the end of it, we will have a working AI character going that we can fight and just test things out against. With that, I say goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>